from Matthew's Gospel uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, which begins at the beginning of chapter 5. And today we're looking at chapter 5, verses 17 to 48. Now this is quite a long passage, uh, and I'm going to divide it into two bits, but they're unequal bits. Uh, we're going to have a look at verses 17 to 20, which is really important as we try to understand Jesus' attitude to what we would call the Old Testament. Uh, and then we're going to have a look at verses 21 to 48, somewhat superficially, uh, because we can't spend all day uh, on this passage. You need to get home to your poached egg on toast or whatever. Uh, so I I'm, I'm focusing on the first four verses and then going to overview uh, the larger part, which is called by scholars the six antitheses, six statements of contrast. Uh, Jesus says, you have heard it said such and so, but I am telling you. Uh, statements of contrast. You have heard this, but I'm telling you that. Uh, so let's dig in. Uh, can I read uh, the opening few verses? Beginning at Matthew 5:17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and I've got to preach on that. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's truth. It's truth eternally. We believe it's truth for us in this generation. We're glad that we can read it. We can read it openly. We have the freedom to do that. And that doesn't pertain in many places in this world. We thank you for the freedom we have to read, to preach, to proclaim the truth of your scripture. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray that he will help us all, help the one who is speaking, help the ones who are listening, because your spirit is the divine teacher. He is the one who makes your word speak into our hearts. Lord, as we open ourselves to your word, as we come to scripture today, would your Holy Spirit speak into our hearts and lives, we pray. Help us to understand and help us to respond and help us to act and to live it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, I should have asked for slide two there, but not to worry. Uh, that, that's fine. That's okay. That's okay, I think. Uh, Jesus and the Old Testament. Uh, let me clarify the phrase, the law and the prophets. Uh, it's a phrase that means the Old Testament. The Old Testament in its entirety. Uh, sometimes it's expressed as the law, the writings, and the prophets. But the law and the prophets is the most common phrase, uh, and it means uh, the scriptures that God handed down to his chosen people, the children of Israel. Uh, and it was, it was part of God's covenant with them. It showed how he wanted them to live, how they were to follow him. Uh, it, it comprised of a lot of things. There were laws for how to worship God. There were laws to how to live as his people. There were laws about being the people of God in community and how you worked as a community together. Uh, and in verse 17 here, uh, Jesus refers to the law and the prophets. Uh, and he says this, uh, almost as though he's countering a criticism of him. He says, don't understand that I've come to destroy this. I've not come to dismantle it. I I've actually come to fulfill it. 
Don't think I've come to destroy it. I have come to fulfill it. And, and the problem was that some of the teachers of the law, some of the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, they'd already got a very strong dislike to the sort of thing Jesus was saying. They were the teachers of the law and they didn't like how Jesus seemed to be saying, no, no, I've got a different way of living. You see, they not only taught the law as it appeared in the Old Testament, this law of God, the law of Moses that was for the people of Israel, but over the years, the rabbis had created lots of extra rules so the people of Israel could understand how they should live a righteous life. There were 248 things that the people of Israel had to do if they were going to follow the law. 248 do's. And there were 365 prohibitions, don'ts. If you want to live a religious and righteous life, then you've got to follow these 248 do's and you've got to refrain from doing the 365 don'ts. And people found they couldn't do this. Uh, they couldn't live as God wanted them to live. And, and God understood that maybe people would fail because he knew people's hearts. So God had made provision for those that fell into sin. There was a system of sacrifices and people, through the work of the priests, found there was forgiveness for the sins they had done as they failed to live in the way the law wanted them to. Uh, and in fact, St. Paul, writing in the book of Romans chapter 7, says one of the great and interesting things about the law is that it shows us that, that we, we, we are not perfect people. God has shown us how to live a righteous life, and we fail. We try to follow the law, but we can't do it. That shows we are imperfect people and we need to find God's forgiveness and Paul goes on to talk then about the gospel and Christ and the significance of the death of, and resurrection of Jesus but we're coming back into Matthew 5 I want you to look us uh, again that I have not come to abolish the law but to fulfill them uh, the Greek is very clear about that that Jesus has come to all that the old law and prophets promised through, his, uh, through God's revelation to Israel. And, and within the Old Testament, through the law and the prophets, uh, God revealed that there would be a promised Messiah whose love and grace would touch not just the people of Israel, but the whole world. So Jew and Gentile would come to find the love of God in a very personal way. Let's, let, let's ponder a little more about this passage we've read. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 18. Uh, Jesus says that uh, nothing that is part of this law uh, will disappear until the final things that have to happen have happened. All that has to be accomplished will be accomplished. Very, very challenging stuff. He talks of a new heaven and a new earth, which are the ultimate expression of, of God's redemption for his people. And then in verse 19, we're told those who break God's commands and teach others to break God's commands are going to be the least in God's kingdom. And then amazingly, in verse 20, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you'll not even enter God's kingdom. And I thought, wow, how, how can that be? Because the Pharisees were fastidious in in how they wanted to live righteously. They did everything as God wanted, or so they thought. How can our righteousness exceed them? 
Well, the answer is this, that, that Jesus is talking not about the breadth of righteousness, but the depth of righteousness. That the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law expressed what righteousness should be by eating this and wearing that and doing this and not doing that. And, and it was superficial how people saw you. But the sort of righteousness that we come to know through Jesus and the gospel is not that outward righteousness the wearing, the doing, the being, the showing stuff that is right. It's an internal righteousness. It's a righteousness inside us. God puts a new heart in our, in our beings. He gives us a, a new way of thinking. He helps us to understand the ways of God and, and how we are to follow them. Can, can we have a look at slide four, please? This, this is quite an important slide for us. This is a bit from St. Paul's uh, letter to the church in Rome. The church in Rome was made up of some Gentiles who had come to believe in Jesus and, and had found forgiveness and, uh, and a new life through faith in him. It was also comprised of, of Jewish people who had come to realize that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah. And they had come to find a new life in him. And Paul, in this bit of Romans, is writing to the church about the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says, Now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. He means no difference between the Jew or the Gentile. There is no difference. For everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory God, of God. And they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes through Jesus. There are two technical words in that. One is justified. Uh, next slide, I think, please. Justified. It's a word used in the law courts of Jesus' time. It meant being declared righteous, being not guilty. And Jesus is saying that, uh, St. Paul is saying that through the death of Jesus, God declares us righteous. God declares us not guilty from sin. We are forgiven. And so we have eternal peace with God. The other technical word is redemption. Uh, this is also a word used in the days of Jesus. Because it was used in the Roman slave markets. Redemption happened when a slave trader who was selling slaves sold one to a new master for a price and that is redemption, being sold for a price to a new owner. And redemption, coming under a new ownership for a price, is, is a technical word from the slave market that is used much in the New Testament by the apostles. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19 tells Christian people, you were bought with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. In fact, the whole of 1 Peter halfway through chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2 develops and expands that if you want to understand more of it. But if you're a Christian, never forget that Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died so that we might be forgiven, so that we might live with God and for God. <laughs>
You remember Graham Kendrick's song, The Price is Paid. It's talking about the price that was paid by Christ on the cross to deal with our sin. And so we, when we come to faith in Jesus and when we experience his salvation, uh, we, we are new people because of all Jesus has done on the cross. We have a new life in Christ. Could we have the next slide, please? What we need to remind ourselves again is that Jesus here is talking about people who, who want to follow him. Uh, living in the way that he describes in the passage that we have before us today is, is not the way to find God's love and salvation. It is the way that we live once we have found God's love and salvation and once God's spirit has begun to work his work inside us. A new life in Christ begins when God brings to our attention what the cross of Jesus is all about. And, and God encourages us to make a response to that and he pours the spirit of God into our lives to help to change us and make us new people. And as we begin to change, it is because of God's working in us who creates a more godly mind, who creates a will to follow the ways of God a heart to love God and do what he wants us to do. So Christ calls us to live differently. And the question is, do you understand all that basic first stuff, you know? There's no point thinking, oh, this is how God wants me to live, if we don't understand, first of all, how we can experience God's grace and forgiveness and a new life. So I need to ask you, are you there yet? Have you been born again into a new life with Christ? And then Jesus goes on to say, and could we have a look at slide seven, please, I think. He goes on to talk about these six antitheses, these six contrasts, these six statements about you have heard it said this, but I'm telling you that. Jesus is beginning to teach those who are his disciples, his followers, and it's pretty challenging stuff. Slide eight is about murder. Verses 21 to 26. The scribes and the Pharisees said murder is evil and it brings God's judgment on people who murder. And not many people disagreed with that. But Jesus says, God's judgment is on our evil attitudes as well as our evil actions. So when we show lasting anger towards someone, when we show constant criticism towards someone, when there is a constant putting down, a, a dismissal of somebody as a person, that negativity is wrong, says Jesus. And he says, if you hate people so much, then you've got to prioritize reconciliation. Settle matters quickly with those that you disagree with. So he's taking the clear and obvious about you can't go around killing people and saying, but your attitude of hatred towards people has got to get resolved as well. Jesus is taking not just the action, but the attitude that produces the action. He is getting to the root of what our hearts are like. Next slide, please. Verses 27 to 31. It is about adultery. Uh, the Pharisees uh, taught about adultery uh, and they said it, it, was, it was not right. But Jesus again takes the act of adultery further. He says, actually, okay, you commit adultery and, and that's wrong. But if you're looking lustfully 
at a woman. That's wrong as well. If your heart is thinking bad and negative thoughts to people, that is wrong and it's very dangerous. And he says some very strange and challenging things in verse uh, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Uh, Friends, this is hyperbole. This is exaggeration. This is how the people of Jesus' day emphasized something that was important. So I don't want you gouging out your eyes or chopping off your right hand after this sermon. But understand what Jesus is saying. He's saying sin is serious and sin is dangerous. And that the lust that leads to adultery is as dangerous as the act of adultery. So he says, get this right. Uh, Some of you know that uh, John Stott, uh, an eminent and now deceased Anglican theologian, uh, wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, a lot of us who are preaching are reading bits of it, although we're not simply reciting what John Stott said. But there's a bit here that I thought was very good. John Stott, writing about these verses on adultery, said, Sin is serious. If your eye causes you to sin, don't look. If your feet walk you to sin, don't go there. If your hand causes you to sin, don't do it. Stop using it. Sin is serious. Difficult words, those. Tough stuff. Next slide, please. Slide number 10 about divorce. Verses 31 and 32 are about divorce. In Jesus' day, uh, two former rabbis had taught about divorce. Uh, Rabbis Hillel and Shammai. And, 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 and there were people who followed their teaching uh, generations forward to Jesus' day. Uh, a lot of their teaching is based on verses in Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, uh, about divorce. Now, Hillel was advocating a, a lax, a, a more liberal understanding of Deuteronomy. Shammai favored a more rigorous and and, and defined interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. And there's a big debate about what do we do? And some people said, well, divorce, we need to do this. And other people said, divorce, we need to do that. And, And John Stott, again, makes three helpful differences between what Jesus is saying and what the rabbis were saying. He said the Pharisees were preoccupied with the idea of, well, what grounds do we have for divorce? But Jesus is most concerned about the institution of marriage and making marriage a good thing for people. The Pharisees called Moses's, Moses' provision for divorce in Deuteronomy 24 a command. But Jesus says, no, 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 it wasn't a command, but it was a concession for the hardness of the human heart. And the third difference that Stott notes is that the Pharisees regarded divorce quite lightly. And Jesus took it seriously, very, very seriously. And I was talking to a certain Anne Boyers about this, uh, not about a divorce for us or anything, uh, about Jesus' teaching. And uh, she said, I think there's another thing in Jesus' teaching, because in Jesus' day, uh, the women sort of had no rights, really. And and, and Jesus' insights on, on divorce and marriage 
are, are trying to give the proper and right and equal rights to the woman in a relationship as the man seemed to have under Moses. So as well as theologians like John Stott, whose wisdom I convey to you, I also convey the wisdom of theologian and Boyers to you on that one. Uh, next slide, please. Perhaps before we move to the next slide, that, that there's something I may need to say that could be helpful to some of us here. Uh, let me turn to 1 Corinthians. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writes a whole chapter in his letter uh, about disputes among Christian believers. Uh, and the start of chapter 6 is about believers who are taking other believers to court. But then he expands this idea to how we as believers are changed people. And he describes in verses 8, 9, 10, 11 about a whole sort, list of people who, whose pre-Christian lives were, were full of sin and pain and wrong. And he says, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, and that is what some of you were but you've been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And Paul is saying, look, it's not what you were before you came to faith in Christ because God has changed you and made you different. And from now on, you need to know the goodness of God because God has changed you. And on this whole issue of divorce, that's really painful and difficult for some people in our society, for some people in our churches. And I don't want you to get bogged down with your past because God has made you new in Christ. He has sanctified you. He has justified you. He has made you righteous. So go on and live on as of now. It's probably added another three or four minutes to the preach. I'm sorry, Rachel. But it was important. Uh, slide 11 is about oaths and swearing of oaths. What on earth is that about? Well, the Pharisees were very keen on oath-taking. I swear by the temple in Jerusalem that this is true. I swear by, I don't know, the walls of Jerusalem that I will promise to do this. And, and for the Pharisees, th th this was a big thing that affirmed your truthfulness and rightness. And Jesus says, look, there's no need to swear an oath by anything. Just be honest in your speech. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus is saying, what is important is truth, and what is important is honesty. So transparent honesty in how you speak and what you say is really important. Listen, politicians. Listen, all of us, perhaps. Slide 12, 38 to 42, an eye for an eye and all that stuff. Uh, that is called lex talionis, the law of retribution, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was part of the old law of Moses. But God had given the people of Israel this law to limit retaliation. If, if someone had knocked your tooth out, you can't smash the whole of their body up in retaliation if in an accident someone had caused your eye to get knocked out you can't take vengeance on several people in their family it was to limit retaliation 
Now, the Pharisees had taken the idea that was really designed to address accidents into personal relationships and, and saw it not as a restrictive thing, but as a permissive thing. It is what you could do. And Jesus says, look, don't, don't respond in that way at all to accidents, even to nasty people. Because followers of me have to show kindness and generosity and love and compassion to all sorts of requests and demands. Next slide, 13. Verses 43 to 48. It's about enemies, as we've heard. Thank you, Beth. The Pharisees knew the law, love your neighbor, but added a little bit to it and hate your enemy. So this was the Pharisees' line. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Love your neighbor and, and show love and grace to your enemy as well. Show love and seek the best even for your enemies because my followers have to live life differently. And if we have slide 14, he says at the end of those verses, 43 to 48, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Now we all know that only God is perfect and we all know that we are imperfect because we get it wrong. We get it wrong sometimes deliberately because we are unloving and unforgiving and not what we should be. And sometimes we get it wrong accidentally because that's just how we are made. For Jew and for Gentile, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, God's purity, God's perfection. And in the teachings of Jesus and of the apostles, nowhere are we told that humanity is sinless and perfect, not this side of eternity. Jesus was confronted by some people who wanted to stone a woman who'd been caught in the act of adultery. He didn't say anything to the man who was involved. They just picked on the woman. And he said, okay, you guys, let the one who is without sin cast the stone first. And they all went away. So how do we understand be perfect? I spent a chunk of time chewing that over. The Greek word is teleos. It's translated perfect. But it's also translated in some passages, complete. It refers to something that has reached its end, is, is mature, is fully grown, is complete. So that word appears in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, meaning perfection. It appears in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6, meaning mature. It appears in Ephesians 4.13, meaning complete. I just pondered whether Jesus is actually saying, be complete in your righteousness, as your Father in heaven is complete. No, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be complete as your Father in heaven is perfect. Meaning, respond to kindness with kindness and generosity outwardly. Love your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you. But also, have kindness and goodness in your heart. Have love and compassion in your heart. Completeness is, is both knowing righteousness internally and expressing righteousness externally. I think God calls us to complete righteousness. We need to be 
aware of an inner righteousness and we need to demonstrate that righteousness as an outer righteousness too. And as we grow in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit grows in us and people will recognize on the outside what God has started to do inside of us. Our lives begin to show on the outside godliness and they show it through priorities, how we live, what our focus is, how we have a degree of purity and honesty and compassion because that's what God is doing, making us new people. So my answer to the big question, how can we be perfect, is no, no, it's about being complete. Showing righteousness, knowing it's inside us and letting it escape outwards. Well, I apologize to the musicians and to everybody else, but this is quite a long, long passage and we can either superficially deal with it or we can address the challenging bits of it. And I hope that's helped you. And may God continue to help us all to live in the way that Jesus wants us to live.